Good morning. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak twice today. First time in this panel two, and uh, second time uh, on uh, the European Model Company Act, the MCA called. So uh, I would like to give a short introduction to uh, the discussion which will uh, follow after my introduction. I will follow the Commission's action plan because in uh, the meeting in, in uh, Dublin, uh, a lot of other uh, things from the action plan was discussed. So uh, today we need to discuss remaining part of the action plan, which, as you see, uh, includes especially encouraging long-term shareholder involvement. So, um, the headline for panel two includes two overall statements. Shareholders should be more engaged, and um, the law or other regulations should encourage long-term engagement. Um, I listened very carefully to uh, my Danish colleague yesterday, saying that uh, the legal profession, the legal professors, don't know anything about what is really going on in, uh, in a normal business life, and that is uh, true, of course. So um, I'm very humble legal professor, which uh, mainly focus on the legal per perspective. What about uh, the regulation perspective? Which means should we use? Um, we should have, of course, um, legal um, means. We, have, we should have legal regulations. Um, I know that a lot of businessmen don't like regulation at all. But uh, still, the experience from the last uh, years show that without legal regulation, things don't uh, things go wrong. So, so um, uh, I sh should say just a few introducing words about uh, these two things. Um, what should we avoid? In my opinion, there are two things we should avoid. We should avoid short-term opportunities behavior. The financial crisis has shown us that directors act short time and opportunistic. Not in all companies, of course, especially in financial companies, we have seen it a lot, but also in large, uh, large listed companies. Mm -hmm. So we should have some legal regulation uh, to avoid opportunistic behavior. I think we will focus a little bit on uh, director's pay, even if we also discussed this matter yesterday, but um, still there's something to be said. I have noted three or four things we have to discuss. The focus on more transparency, the focus on risk management. We didn't mention this today, yesterday, but I, I think this should be a, an important uh, part of the discussion also, risk management. If we consider risk management uh, very carefully, we should also um, f uh, foster long-term engagement. And then, um, then uh, uh, I, th I would say some words, not now, but afterwards, about uh, the, the, um, the choice between law and uh, uh, codes. There are three issues we have to discuss following the, 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 the action plan. Shareholders' oversight of related party transactions. What is it? Uh, there is a definition in, the, in the, the action plan. 
Shareholder-related uh, party transaction means that there is some contracting between the company and the directors or main shareholders. There has been a, a discussion in the European Corporate Governance Forum recommending that we should strengthen uh, the, the, uh, the, the regulation, independent evaluation of substantive transactions, as you see, and uh, more shareholder control over related parties' transaction. Well, um, in my opinion, this is about conflict of interest. And uh, this should be a part of the regulation of conflict of interest. Uh, since I have only 15 minutes left for my introduction of the MCA, I would just mention now that uh, we have a meeting here in, in Vilnius, I think it's the 5th of December, uh, discussing and finalizing our chapter 8 on director's duties and conflict of interest. And this is for sure a part of conflict of interest regulation. We should disclose, there should be a, dis the, a, a duty to disclose conflict of interest, which is, this is a, an example of, to the other people, the independent uh, directors, or to the shareholder meeting. And if all directors are conflicted, this is a, a, a thing for the shareholder meeting. What we need to discuss and decide in the MCA is, should we have a mandatory rule that the shareholder should approve such, uh, such uh, related party transactions. Uh, well, I think that the first, uh, the, first pro the first thing, evaluation of substantial transaction is a very costly thing. I think it's, it's uh, sufficient to make, for instance, make a short report to the annual general meeting saying that uh, in this year we have had some uh, related party transactions. Uh, please uh, please uh, discharge uh, the, the directors for this, and that's it. I would like to listen to argue your arguments uh, if this should not be sufficient. The second part of uh, our discussion should should uh, relate to the question of acting in concert. Three things. There is a discussion about shareholder identification. For those who are familiar with the Swedish Companies Act and uh, Norwegian also, uh, you know that in Sweden there is full uh, publicity about who are shareholders. On the other hand, in Denmark we have been uh, hesitant uh, to, uh, to uh, give not only the, the company but also and especially other shareholders the opportunity to, to identify their shareholder colleagues. Of course, if you should Together, if you should speak together, if you should uh, resist some proposition uh, coming up on the general meeting or in preparation by the, the directors, the shareholders need to get into contact with each other. So um, there is a discussion about bearer shares and registered shares. We are considering have seen in the, the, the action plan that uh, beer share as well as register share should be allowed. But uh, of course, uh, if you allow beer shares, it's hard to identify the other, uh, the other shareholders. 
And if you don't have access to the book of shareholders, it's even more difficult. So there is a discussion about uh, bill share versus register shares. We should, we should take this discussion. Uh, then there's two, the, the, the action plan mentioned two things. They take over regulation, um, the mandatory bid rule, if you have more than 30, 40 percent of the shares, you, you are obliged to, to offer the, the other shareholders a mandatory bid. This is not only for one shareholder, but also for shareholders acting in concert. I know that this, and the action plan also knows that, that this has caused a lot of trouble, a lot of discussion, a lot of interpretation. What do we really mean with action in concert? So I'm, uh, I agree that uh, this should be made more clear. This is, I think this is a, a technical question, especially. And uh, also the transparency directive, uh, the, the duty to, um, to publish um, about major shareholders, there is a similar problem uh, to, to clarify, as the, the action plan says. Also, this, I think, is, is a, 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 a technical matter. The third and last question I would introduce is the continued discussion about institutional investors. I think that uh, the main question could be is ins institutional or are institutional investors more permanent investors? Are there long-term investors? I don't think so. You decide. Will, will you listen very carefully what you, your experiences is on this uh, topic? Um, we discussed yesterday a little about uh, coming, uh, coming regulation on transparency, on voting policies. I uh, would like to listen to the discussion, what is the incentive for the, the institutional investors to be active? Uh, I listened carefully also to, to what was said to, uh, yesterday, that there should not be a binding, a binding um, regulation that institutional investors should be active. They should decide themselves, but they should be transparent on their voting policies. Uh, the incentive is to be active. Um, well, a mandatory rule is a, a rather strict in incentive, but uh, do the uh, institutional investors also have their own incentives to be active? It is costly if you own a part of 25,000 uh, companies all over the world. I think it's costly and uh, difficult to be active on each company, is it possible? For small companies, for small countries like Lithuania, Denmark, uh, well, I think the result could be that um, a, a US-based institutional investor would say, well, Denmark is too small. We don't invest in Denmark. This should not be in our interest. As, uh, last thing I would, should mention in this introduction is where should the, the regulation be found? Um, my first uh, thinking is that what is an uh, institutional investor? This is many different things. There are alternative investment fund. There are asset managers yeah, of different kinds. There are um, banks, life insurance companies. There are a lot of different things. And if we should regulate, where should it be? Should it be in the Companies Act? This is my concern. Should it be in the Companies Act? No, I don't think so. I, don't, I think that uh, codes like the UK Stewart Code is uh, preferable or if you have special regulation of 
for instance, alternative investment companies. This, uh, there is in Denmark, we had just implemented the, the directive on this. Uh, the regulation should be, according to my opinion, should be in this, in this act. So uh, I hope to have introduced some questions which my colleagues could uh, follow up on, and I would like to, uh, to answer any questions also, if I'm able to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for such a very, very in topic, very important topic. And now I would like to introduce the, the, uh, the panel moderator, Mr. Chris Hodge, the Director of Corporate Governance UK Financial Reporting Council. The, the main purpose of this session is, as Paul said, to, to get some panel discussion going on the issues we've just discussed. The only thing I will say about myself is, as, as Paul just mentioned, we have introduced a UK stewardship code three years ago, which is an attempt uh, through the sort of um, approach that Paul was talking about and, and a version of what Ugo Massey was talking about yesterday uh, through a bit of transparency to encourage investors to take a more long-term approach. It's still very much in its early days. We're not sure yet whether it's going to have the effect that we hope it will. So from our point of view, it's very interesting and very timely to have this discussion here today. We will go through the four issues that, that Paul raised more briefly than we'd like, unfortunately, given the time available, uh, but hopefully enough to stimulate some interest and some questions from the floor. Related party transactions, acting in concert, the transparency approach, and specifically some of the proposals that Ugo Bassi outlined yesterday, and then this broader question about are investors interested in long-term stewardship and engagement, and if so, how do you incentivize them to, to do that? Uh, so with those brief introductory remarks, I'll ask the rest of the panel to to join us at this point, so, and then I will introduce them to you once we're all settled. Paul, we've already met. Uh, and next to Paul is Gintautas Bartkus, who's the, the Lithuanian element of the panel. He's an advocate, managing partner of the Baltic Legal Solutions Lithuania and a lecturer in law at Vilnius University. He used to be at the Lithuanian Ministry of Justice where he worked on company law and the civil code. So very well qualified to talk about both how you write the law, but also how you apply it. Uh, next to him is Annika Putanainen. Annika is the head of surveillance for NASDAQ OMX in the Nordic region, which covers the stock exchanges in Sweden, Finland, and Denmark. As well as surveillance, she's responsible for developing listing rules and the rules around IPOs, and previously worked for the Swedish Financial Supervisory Authority. Uh, so we have two sort of reformed regulators, if you like, here. Next along is, is Mikkel Skugard. Mikkel is representing the asset managers on the panel. He's the vice president of corporate governance and responsible investment at BlackRock, who, as you probably know, are one of the world's largest asset management firms. As of the end of 2012, globally, they were responsible for 3.8 trillion US dollars of assets under management, which gives you an idea of the scale of, of their operation. Mikkel personally is responsible for analysis, engagement, and voting in a number of markets, including the Nordic countries and the UK. Uh, and last but by no means least, we have Jella Benaheidika. Jella is the Chief Managing Director of DSW, which is the leading shareholder association in Germany with more than 25,000 members. She's also Vice President of the European Federation of Financial Services Users, which, as the name suggests, represents various groups such as savers, shareholders, holders of life insurance policies, and, and many others. Uh, she's also a member of the Stock Exchange Board in Dusseldorf, so again, a very interesting mix and, and hopefully a, a wide range of perspectives that we can, we can pick up on. I'd like to, to kick us off on related party transactions by asking Gintautas perhaps to respond to the introductory remarks that Paul made. Um, is there an issue about having common principles across the EU? Are the current arrangements adequate? If not, what do we need to do to, uh, to address those? Yeah, hello. Yeah, Chris, thank you. That's that's that's. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> most probably we should start from 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 being more specific on on what 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 is the actually the the proposal because it's based on the on the on the statement made by uh, European uh, Corporate Governance Forum regarding related party transactions for listed companies, and in short, uh, the ECGF. Uh, proposed to establish two, qu two quantitative uh, thresholds, 1% and 5% of total company assets. And transactions representing less uh, than 1% of 
assets are exempt from any special uh, reporting requirements, but should be reviewed by the independent directors. The transaction representing between 1 and 5% of assets should be publicly announced at the time of the transaction and should be approved um, by an independent advisor. And finally, the transaction representing more than 5% of assets should be voted on by shareholders at the general meeting. Uh, and uh, from the action plan as well, we see that the commission uh, possibly intends to propose amendments to the shareholders' right directives. So the question actually uh, remains uh, here, uh, are there any other instruments or, uh, or mechanisms to, to, to attack this, this, this issue? And uh, if we will look to the OECD uh, report related party transaction and minority shareholders' rights, uh, there's uh, five possible approaches mentioned. Uh, first, shareholders are given direct say in approving related party transaction, uh, something similar to what ECGF proposed. Uh, second, minority shareholders are able to vote directly for a board member for their choosing. In this case, the board approved the related party transactions. Third, the controlling shareholder has a fiduciary duty to other shareholders and the company, and abusive related party transaction would be against the interest of the minority shareholder, and this represents the breach of duty. So that's the, the, the th third option. The fourth option is uh, that uh, the board is given the right to approve their transaction, uh, and with um, this task typically passed to the auditing uh, committee or uh, committee of Independent Board Members. Uh, we have fifth option, the prohibition of self-dealing transaction, which is of course not, not very popular in, in our days, but uh, still applies in some countries to such things as loans uh, to, to directors. And finally, uh, we have as well option, uh, um, this is a statutory right to the use of independent experts which helps with evaluation issues and, 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 and others. And, and then I would, uh, I would uh, like to, to, to add what Paul mentioned, is that uh, there's as well uh, other view to the, to, the, to the related party transaction is, is through the conflict of interest rules. So in fact, we have here almost six or, 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 or even seven options which, which is available now in, in, in the countries. And then, <coughs> while, while setting the legal strategies to address this issue, uh, one should not forget that such matters are potentially too complex to adequately regulate with prohibition and exceptions. Uh, as well, one should also keep in mind related problems of information asymmetry and compliance cost. Uh, uh, the, and uh, more generally, uh, uh, the question still remains, is more complex rules will not lead to more, uh, to more active shareholders. Uh, <coughs> the, the one thing it seems to me uh, uh, salt in, 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 and, and no, no one is disputing it, this, uh, I mean the ratios of uh, IS24, uh, 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 which defines related, related party transactions. And um, <clears throat> it seems to me that the, the issue itself on, on, on the definition is not longer, uh, not longer an issue. So, but rather, it is formal enforcement that still remains weak. Uh, there are some novel elements you can, you can find in a in, 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 in number of countries, like security regulation, regulator financially supporting uh, derivative or class action suits. Uh, like uh, special departments in the, in the court system uh, which, which handling, handling these cases. But nevertheless, all these uh, enforcement actions still seems to be uh, more costly than simple uh, Wall Street rule. Uh, if you don't like the manager, management, sell your stocks. Uh, coming back to the EU perspective and the EU initiatives on, on, on uh, initiative in this area uh, it seems to me uh, it's very good to 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 uh, 
to remember the, the reflection, reflection group uh, um, opinion on the or recommendation on the um, uh, on the um, uh, on on when and and uh, when and uh, and why we need uh, to have uh, European intervention in in this area. So and uh, and um, uh, as it was stated in the reflection group report, EU harmonisation should be done after careful vetting on the fact of the facts. EU harmonization should be focused and aimed at particular problems, and EU harmonization should respect the national corporate governance systems. So, um, having in mind that, uh, if we will look to the to the to that issue from a little bit historic perspective, you will see that uh, firstly it was mentioned by the high-level group of company law experts in their report. And uh, the uh, report actually argued in favor of initiative for greater disclosure, not, not uh, approval, but disclosure. Uh, it's interesting to point out as well that the majority of respondents on green paper con uh, consultations uh, share the view that sufficient safe safeguards are already in place. Uh, and, and finally, uh, if if if, um, uh, if if you would look to the uh, to the uh, research made uh, re relate to, uh, uh, research made to the to, uh, regarding this issue, you will see that related party transactions are mainly with a controlling shareholder or with members of the company group. So this this means that the issue of group interest interest should be considered as well, and most probably should be considered first. Otherwise, uh, I mean the the the, the they're trying to solve the, the, the related party transaction without, without uh, saying anything about the group interest uh, might, be, might be an issue. So, and having in mind all this, what, what, what I, I, I mentioned here, uh, so the, the question still remains, is it really the time for, uh, for, for, um, for hard law uh, to be proposed and, 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 and introduced? Thanks very much, Kintaris. There's a, a number of issues raised there, but in the interest of time, I'll try to boil them down to, to two. The first one on which I'll be interested in, in Yella and Mikkel's uh, views as shareholders is of the various options that you outlined, is there a preference from the shareholder perspective to have a direct say, or the, uh, would they be happy with some of the other controls and in, enhanced mechanisms that you described? Uh, you also raised the question about the, the relative importance of enforcement as opposed to the actual content of the rule. And uh, after we've heard from, from the two investors on the panel, perhaps Annika might say uh, whether that's a, there are practical issues around enforcement of the rules that you've, you've come across in your experience. But, but Yella, Mikhail, do you want to say anything on this? Yes, let me start uh, with the issue here related to party transactions. Um, first of all, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, I think. I agree with Paul. Uh, I think it's all uh, an issue of conflict of interests. That's the main issue. Uh, and uh, if I take a look at the German system, uh, that's where I come from, uh, we already have the auditor having a look at the related party transactions. And there is already a report by the um, auditor, but it's only directed to the supervisory board so far in our system. Uh, but I think it is a good idea to uh, inc increase the disclosure because whatever you can do uh, in case of conflicts of interest is to increase the transparency. So I uh, think uh, there are good reasons to disclose more information, for example, the report to the shareholders. And also, it's, uh, I think it's a charming idea to have an approval of the shareholder, although I think good information on the report and maybe an advisory vote of the shareholders would be sufficient and I would like to see actually being it reduced to material transactions. I think that's why it is very important mm -hmm. to have these thresholds because I mean the shareholder already receives a lot of information and it should be only reduced to useful material information. And I think the shareholder is only interested in transactions which are really material. So no, maybe no, I think this that's is a, the view. A from very good point show. about <laughs> transparency and disclosure in, in general, actually. Michael, you must see many different systems in the, in the different markets you work in. I mean, we, uh, we agree on this. So we're quite, um, 
we demand transparency when it comes to um, related part and sections, but as uh, Jella said, we also demand the right to vote on material party transactions, not every single one of them, because a lot of them fall within the normal course of the business. But uh, I think the transparency is the key, given, as she mentioned, is the conflict of interest that is the problem here. And I think they should be fully disclosed and they should be fully explained in that sense. And I think there are other aspects you need to value as a shareholder, which is how are these related tra uh, party transactions valued, by who, who approves them and who reviews them? And in the end, who act, does the independent audit committee have a veto or something like that? It's uh, the independent. So that's the, that's the information that you're making. Yeah, interested. yeah, yeah. But as uh, she mentioned, I mean, we have to review a lot of information all the time. And I think if you have to disclose every single related part and section, that can be quite a lengthy process to go through. And so I think material is the key for us. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And can we enforce something? Yes. In, um uh, Sweden, we have um, quite strong shareholders, quite many family-owned companies. So these are quite relevant for Swedish companies, these rules about related party transactions. And we have a rule in our exchange uh, uh, rules that says that they should be disclosed to the market. And there is no threshold. All related party transactions should be uh, disclosed to the market. And it has to do with trust that uh, uh, no uh, shareholder or, or um, management person is favored in any way. So it has to do with trust. So that's also a deterrent, of course, for the company to, to favor anybody because they need to disclose it to the market. So that's quite a good way of, of taking care of it. We have also had in our exchange rules a rule that said in, that in significant transactions, uh, there must be a fairness opinion, and the uh, transaction must also be approved by the uh, general meeting. We don't have that rule anymore in the exchange rule because we don't think it fits there. It's actually now taken care of by, by the Swedish Securities Council that can give opinions on that. So the same procedure is left in, in Sweden, but it, it's the self-regulatory body that uh, uh, issues statements about it, if it's good market practice or not. And uh, it has been very relevant when a company is in a financial crisis and you have a strong shareholder, that it might, there might be a tendency to favor that shareholder with some uh, transactions. So it is very relevant to have. But enforcement afterwards and going through courts, I don't think that's a good idea. And you know, it will take 10 years and, and nothing it's, will it's come not out of it. It's not an effective mechanism. Transparency is good. While, while you have floor, Annika, I'd like to come on to the acting in concert. And I, I should say that, uh, and I should have explained this to Paul, so apologies to him, that I think when we've had gone, we've trotted through the four different issues, I'd like to come back to Paul to, to pick up on any points that he's, he's spotted that uh, relate to the questions we started with. Uh, but obviously, uh, acting in concert, at least in, in the UK, this has become quite a significant issue because, as David Jackson from BP explained yesterday, for those of you who are here, we have a very dispersed shareholder base, and so the only way that institutions and, and retail shareholders can be effective is by working together to hold the boards to account. And clearly, when you're encouraging collective engagement, this raises issues about whether that activity falls foul of, of various acting in concert rules. So as somebody who I imagine has had to both uh, define acting in concert but also have to try and detect it when, when it happens, I'd be very interested in your perspective on some of the practical issues around around that subject? Yes, before, the, I was, uh, before working for the exchange, I worked for the Swedish FSA, and, and, and we were responsible for the takeover uh, regulation as well. And twice I have been involved in investigations where we have tried to define acting in concert. In <laughs> both cases, we're in, re in relation to the truck maker, Scania, which has had many corporate governance issues. We can write a book about that company, but that's another seminar. But it was in 2006, uh, it was, uh, 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 the Wallenberg controlled uh, company Investor and their uh, foundations, the Wallenberg foundations that had, had uh, bought shares in Scania and uh, we needed to try to define whether or not they were acting in concert. And it was based on circumstantial evidence mostly and, um, and that's the, the really uh, difficult part. In, in Sweden, and I would guess also for the Nordic countries in general, we want to have facts in place 
that, that, uh, uh, that are the sort of the connecting link between the parties and not circumstantial evidence. evidence. And, and, and we, we didn't uh, manage to find that um, formal link, even though the definition says that it can be an informal or a formal agreement. But in practice, uh, I think in, in Sweden and, and the legal tradition, it's very hard to, to try to uh, make a decision on circumstantial evidence. So, the, uh, and the same was in, in 2008. It was MAN and Volkswagen, uh, uh, where uh, whether or not they had come over the mandatory bid uh, threshold. And uh, at that time, Volkswagen was not the, the parent of, uh, of MAN, but there were links, they, they were, there was shareholding. But that was also circumstantial, so, so we didn't actually uh, come to a conclusion there as well. So um, even though in the UK, I know the UK takeover panel says that the definition should be broad, and, and that uh, circumstantial evidence is, is, is enough, and you can, on each case, you can actually define it. In the Nordics, this doesn't work. We need to have more substance in, in our decisions, and we need to have uh, maybe presumptions uh, that, that need to be rebutted than, than by, by the persons acting in concert. That would be, that would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, that's that's uh, very interesting. I'm going to ask Gintautas, perhaps, to pick up on this, this question of the relationship between definition and, and enforcement, which, uh, as you've highlighted, for a, for a provision in this area to be enforceable, it has to be relatively specific for you to be able to, to um, identify the, the activities and, and, and ring fence them, if that's the right phrase. Uh, but at the same time, there's, there's an understandable desire that the legal definition shouldn't be too tightly prescribed if that then prevents other activities being, being carried out that are legitimate and, and not related to acting in concert. Uh, one of the specific ideas I know that has been tabled is, is an idea of what I think is called a white list of activities that are clearly acceptable, and whether that might be a supplement to a, a, a the legal definitions. And I, I, I don't know if you can tell us whether you have any thoughts on that specific idea, but the issue around definitions more generally. Uh, is that a yes or no? <laughs> No, I mean, uh, um, I, I agree to, to Paul on, 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 on his remarks that it's more technical thing, uh, I think, to, 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 to have uh, the definition which is, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, broad enough and which, uh, which, uh, which uh, would not create the, the, the problems we have uh, in, 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 in these days. So I would see that as a more technical thing uh, and, and uh, uh, from that point of view, it's it's not. It's it seems to me it's easy to 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 to, to tackle. It's easy to solve because, uh, nah, mm, yeah, yeah, I agree. That's a more technical yeah. thing. I, the other aspect of it, uh, I suppose, is to what extent are the existing rules really a barrier to collective engagement? And this is something that we find certainly in the UK quite hard to judge whether it's a, a genuine barrier or it's used essentially as an excuse by those investors who don't want to. Uh, to engage collectively for, for a reason, provide a reason why they shouldn't do so. First, Michael and, and Yellow, do you have any thoughts on the extent to which this is a real problem? Um, well, being maybe acting in concert, one remark, I'm not, I'm not representing institutional investors, of I'm course, representing yeah, of retail investors, but what I heard from the institutional investor side, and uh, maybe Mikael can say much more, is that obviously there is an uncertainty with regard to when do they act really in concert and when is it shareholder cooperation which is still legally allowed. And very often it seems to be an obstacle also for uh, active engagement of shareholders and uh, I think a much better cooperation. And I think it's very, something very important. Uh, shareholders, not only the retail ones but also the large ones, should try to cooperate, mm -hmm. and if there is an obstacle, then we need a clear definition of acting in concert to just to uh, get rid of this uh, uncertainty, this legal uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, I, I find the acting in concert concept very important in relation to the mandatory bid uh, when that is triggered, and that is when it should be used, when two shareholders are cooperating in, in, and they are uh, with the objective to gain control of the company. 
So I think that's relevant for acting in concert. Then if you engage, two shareholders engage together, cooperate in trying to influence the board, uh, resolutions and so forth, I don't see that as uh, acting in concert because they are not seeking control of the company. And actually the UK takeover panel has issued a, a brilliant practice statement on this it's number 26, if you want to look up that one, that is, uh, they also uh, take up this, that only board control-seeking resolutions, those might be, be, be those that are triggered acting in, in, in concert, where the shareholders try to uh, maybe uh, replace uh, one director with a director that is uh, uh, favorable to them, uh, that uh, represents their, their, their interests, so actually, uh, what the UK takeover panel says that in most cases this is not triggered the control seeking uh, mm. part of, of acting in concert so and I have not seen this uh, I've only seen acting in concert concept in relation to mandatory bids and and I think maybe uh, I think it's it's maybe not needed or needs to be discussed when you, you uh, engage in, in so shareholding. It, yeah. it sounds like the, the key bit of any definition is, is what, how you define control, Precisely. perhaps. So it doesn't, it doesn't hinder effective shareholder cooperation, yeah. in my opinion. Is that your experience? Yeah, that's uh, what we experience as well. Um, <clears throat> we have seen a notable increase in the level of collective engagement during the last years in the UK mostly as a result of an encouragement through either the stewardship core, the care review, or several sources that ha has allowed us to cooperate with other shareholders, exchange information with other shareholders, engage collectively without even coming even close to the boundaries of the law and the thing. So in the UK, it's quite a clear thing. Uh, the problem is when you start, it's very difficult to engage with other shareholders, let's say, in the continent, because it's, the boundaries of the law are not clear, and that acts as a barrier for other, perhaps, investors in the continent not wanting to um, uh, engage collectively in that sense. And I think we, further guidance can be provided as to what is the scope of acting in concert uh, on a European level in that sense. I think it's, it's a quite important thing to do because especially in cases where there's a full free float, I think collective engagement takes an important, uh, uh, is even more important in, in that sense. No. While we have you, well, we'll, we'll move on because we don't have a lot of time for any of these issues, unfortunately. Uh, transparency and, and some of the proposals that we heard from Ugo Bassi yesterday, the, some elements of what he said were, were set out in the action plan, the proposal that asset managers and also asset owners, there's a question about how you define what an asset owner is, uh, should disclose some information about their approach to engagement and voting and also the details of, of their voting record in the case of the, the asset managers institutions. There were a number of other elements you mentioned, which certainly, for me, I had not heard mentioned before as potentially being covered in the Shareholder Rights Directive, such as the stock lending policy, information about portfolio turnover and the costs associated with that. It's, it's a bit unfair to ask you to respond publicly to those proposals you know, 12 hours after hearing them, but I'm going to do that anyway, if that's all right. So, I mean, two questions, I suppose. Do you think the, the approach of more transparency is the right approach to try and encourage uh, long-term investment uh, and on the specific proposals as they were outlined yesterday. Mm -hmm. any, any observations on the practicalities perhaps mm -hmm. involved? I think it's quite important to understand that just as we seek more transparency from the companies we invest in, we also see, seek to explain not only to our clients and the companies we invest in, both to the market in general, our stand on, on a number of issues. Um, we're fully transparent with uh, our voting policies, we're fully transparent with our corporate governance principles or engagement principles, meaning that we disclose, for example, to our clients on a quarterly basis our voting um, records, as well as quarterly commentaries highlighting any uh, unusual voting activity or big uh, voting decisions, large engagements we have undertaken. So we are quite transparent with our, with our, um, with our clients in that sense. And, and furthermore, we also file every August with the Securities and Exchange Commission all our voting records, which are publicly available, I think. And it's quite important. And we have been quite transparent with the way we vote in, in that sense. No, because we, can, we think it's important things that come out in the public domain or think things that are transparent are things that get addressed at some point in that sense. And I think where we perhaps have historically drawn the line is that we are 
bit more hesitant to disclose a uh, level of uh, um, who we engage with. And we have never disclosed, and we don't intend to disclose, how we vote before we actually vote to the public. We do advise the company how we're going to vote before the AGM takes place to uh, try to explain them a bit our stance and try to tell them what they can do in order to change that voting outcome. So I think transparency from our side, transparency from our side is something that we have been do uh, doing for a long time, and I think it's quite a positive trend in that sense. So. And presumably for, for an institution of your size, not that there are many of your size, uh, with all your global activities and the number of different funds that you run, but other practical issues about trying to pull together some of the information that was being suggested yesterday? In terms of? Uh, in terms of um, in some of the detailed information about turnover, for example. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I remember that comment yesterday. It was a, um, a comment around trying or having to disclose your portfolio turnover and your portfolio cost. And I think, uh, given the size, I would ask what is it we're trying to achieve by disclosing this information in that sense? Because I suppose given the size of our company, we have hundreds of portfolios, hundreds of funds, hundreds of uh, institutes that if you had to disclose this on a quarterly basis or semi-annual basis or an annual basis, it would be quite a lot of... Um, uh, the implications of this would be, would be quite considerable for us. It would be quite a heavy reporting burden that I don't see what purpose that would serve in that sense. Right. I mean, one of the, the, the assumptions behind the transparency proposals in the, in the action plan is I, I've understood them and certainly behind the, the stewardship co pro code approach that we've taken in the UK is that um, as far as disclosure by the, the, the fund managers is concerned, it enables the clients to make a more informed choice about whether there is a manager who shares their approach to, to long-term stewardship, to engagement and so on. And there was a challenge yesterday in, in the panel session as to whether that is an issue that really matters to, to clients and therefore whether that whether there's a value in the transparency if, if, if it doesn't lead to a, a change in, in manager selection or whatever by clients. Um, I suppose, Yana, perhaps you're the, you're the closest to, to representing owners in that sense on the panel. Well, Do you have any views on the extent to which owners feel that they care about these issues and expect to see that delivered by their managers? Well, with regard to the role of institutional investors, uh, I think, again, transparency is the key issue. And if an institutional investor has a voting policy, should disclose it. If uh, the fund does not have a voting policy, should disclose it doesn't have a voting policy. And uh, in general, I would assume they would have a voting policy, they would have an engagement policy, so they should be very transparent on this. And I also believe that uh, um, the institution investor should be transparent with regard to the exercise of their votes. I mean, I don't, I'm not as interested as the end investor um, in the votes with yes, but I'm interested where uh, the institution investor votes with no or abstain. So I think it's, it's relatively easy to publish um, after the general meeting the information on in which dimension you, you, the fund voted with no or abstain. And, I mean, we do it as a non-profit organization with regard to our uh, members, which are retail investors. So I think it should not be a big problem for institutional investors to do the same. Thanks. Uh, we, we unfortunately have five minutes left before we, we throw it open to the, the floor. So what I'd, I'd like to do, if I may, uh, is come on to the final question that Paul raised, which is about incentives. We've talked a bit about barriers and about transparency, but whether there are ways of incentivizing both uh, end investors, but also the institutions uh, to take a more long-term approach. Uh, I'd like to start with you, Yella, if I may, uh, to get your thoughts on that and whether there are any specific ways of incentivizing investors that you think are worth considering. Then perhaps come back down the line for a very quick view on whether there is, you know, if we could do one thing to incentivize long-term stewardship, what would it be? And then ask Paul perhaps to reflect on, on some of the points that have been raised during the discussion picking up the points that you made at the, at the beginning, if that's okay? Yeah, okay. I have noticed... Uh, uh, sorry, I'll yeah, start with Yellow yeah, if I may, yeah. Paul, and then work, work our way back down and yeah, okay. save the best till last. But. Okay, so <laughs> I'll try to start. Um, I think the one thing we learned about the financial crisis is that we should not be too dependent on the banks. So, um, of course, as a representative of a shareholder association, I'm very much in favor of promoting 
more investments in equity. And I think there are several things uh, we can do. There is a certain role of the government, uh, national government. Uh, they can uh, give tax incentives uh, to promote uh, long-term engagement in equity. I think that's very important. Right now, we have more or less punishment from the government side because we have things like the financial transaction tax, we have a double taxation of dividends uh, cross-border. So this is not at all an incentive, it's a punishment that we have right now. And um, we also see in Germany, but I think all over Europe, uh, that due to the low interest rates and uh, due to inflation, actually uh, the, uh, ac uh, the, the assets of uh, the pensioners, for example, is devaluating constantly. So equity could open the door. And uh, I think what we need in this respect is we have to work much more on issues as investment education. I think this is also an issue that we should focus on. There should be more information, education of the retail investor. And um, equity is also important, I think, for uh, the industry because you have the small and medium-sized enterprises. And they have very often in Europe succession problems. And there is one way to get uh, out of it is, and there is an exit if you go to the stock exchange. So I think uh, there sh we should take all measures necessary on a national but also on a European level to promote long-term engagement in equity. So just briefly, uh, a level playing field well, these in are regulatory terms exactly. with different asset classes and investor education, there's two. Uh, Michael, any yeah. interesting to add to that? So I'll come up with um, two points why we think being an active owner is quite important for us because in fulfilling our fiduciary duty, that will sometimes involve engaging with companies. Uh, that's our main incentive to engage. <clears throat> but you have to understand that we manage around four trillion US dollars in assets. Half of that is in equities, and around 80% of that is invested through um, index tracking strategies, meaning as opposed to an active management of the shares, you cannot sell or buy, you hold the shares as long as the company is listed in a stock exchange. So you are by default a long-term shareholder. And therefore, knowing that, I think engagement with the companies acquires even a more prominent role in wanting to affect change over time. And therefore, we are often supportive of management during voting season and during engagement <clears throat> in the short run as they work through changes in the long run. I think that's, those are the main two reasons why we choose to engage. Oh, that's very, very clearly expressed. Yeah. I agree actually with everything uh, that uh, Jella said her, uh, earlier and, and uh, so I don't have that much to, to add. I could just point out the two. The, the tax incentive, I think that's an important one because money talks in, this, uh, in the markets. And then uh, also focus on more listings, more SMEs to the market. We, we have a trend that we have less and less listed companies. We need more listed companies. Uh, so we need to create more interest in, in that. And, and then with tax incentives, uh, that will create uh, long-term engagement and growth and more, more jobs, basically, in, in Europe. So quite a bit of agreement so far. Anything to add? Yeah. The, the, the uh, it seems to me, I mean, if you would look to the, the of course, uh, there's a number of opinions about, about the, uh, and the different opinions about the long-term engagement and uh, versus short-term engagement or long-term engagement versus short-term investment. But, but uh, it seems to me that there's a number of solutions which are already existing in, in, in countries like, like loyalty shares, like, like, uh, like extra dividends and voting rights and, and others. So, uh, uh, tax incentive, that, that might be another option, but uh, the, the question though, which I would uh, raise is do, do we need to actually the, the, the legislation there on the EU level? Yes, uh, it seems to me that, that, that there's a number of approaches uh, st still can be, can be uh, found in, 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 in the country. So uh, that's, that's the question which, which would remain. I mean, uh, do we really need uh, uh, EU legislation on that point? 
especially when we uh, the, the tax, tax concerns as well. I mean, it's, it's that's coming up as a bit of a theme, isn't it? Huh? Paul, I'm afraid I'm going to ask you the impossible to try yeah, and uh, give uh, your reflections in no more than three or four minutes, well, so we have a bit of time for questions. I have three small comments on what we have said until now. Um, one to each of the topics uh, first, um, about related party transactions. The Commission will take an initiative, uh, especially regarding amending the shareholder directive um, shareholder, um, yeah, uh, shareholder rights directive, but this is about listed companies. The problem about uh, a related party is also a problem for all other companies, mm -hmm. not only, but maybe especially for, for closed companies. So it's, <coughs> it's not enough to consider this problem in the light of listed companies. Listed companies is important, of course, but also other companies. That's why we try to figure out some uh, rules in, in our MK um, concept. Second, uh, I would like to uh, um, say one short remark on acting in concert. Uh, we know that this is a UK invention from the original takeover uh, um, panel uh, yes. code um, spread about to all the European countries, including Denmark. And I don't think we, uh, this was, as I understood, a way to circumvent the mandatory bid rule. Am I right? Yes. The idea is good, but practice is bad. Uh, I don't think, <laughs> I, I think we agree that uh, it's hard to practice. We have a lot, in, also in Denmark, we have a lot of cases where people act in concert, but the, the authorities uh, are not willing to go into this problem and say, well, you two guys, maybe you know the Danish football uh, team, uh, FCK uh, football. There were two guys, uh, each uh, having a uh, little less than 30% they, they try to, to take over this, but no, concert, no acting in concert was stated. Uh, the last thing is that today, uh, yesterday we, uh, we heard that there is a distinction between institutional investors' dialogue with the company and the problem of voting. We have uh, discussed voting, transparency about voting policies, but what about transparency, about dialogue? Uh, the, the situation in Denmark, at, le at least, is that um, recently we have, uh, we have uh, uh, the Danish um, windmill company Vestas, maybe some of you know that uh, they have uh, just fired the Danish uh, CEO and uh, they took a, a suite to be the new CEO and many of us uh, wondered why didn't the Danish institutional shareholders uh, come up and vote against or for or even, even did something on the general meeting. But what happened is, of course, that they had a dialogue uh, before the general meeting saying, this is enough, now we need a new CEO. So even if we had a lot of transparency about the voting policy, the, the way they, at least the Danish institutional investors uh, work out is through dialogue. Mm -hmm. And what about this? No, I think that's a, that's a very interesting point, actually. And certainly the, what we're told by both investors and companies in the UK is a lot of the most effective engagement is, is, is never seen publicly. And their view, at least, is that it would be less effective if it was carried out in public. But, but it does raise exactly the issue that you, you say that for, for others with an interest, the, there isn't a total full transparency about what is going on. So I think that's quite an interesting challenge. Uh, thanks very much to all of the panel. We now have only five minutes, I'm afraid, for questions. Uh, so there are some microphones here. There's a gentleman over there wanting to raise questions. Start with. Um, Patrick McGee, um, just some reflections on 18 years as advising UK corporates, including two years of the UK takeover panel. I think the spectrum of issues we've got today 
I would categorise as absolutely right to regulate, right to regulate but hard to do, and I'd question the need to regulate around long-term engagement. In terms of related party transactions, that's some of the hardest advice uh, myself and my firm ever had to give because almost every time there's a related party transaction, there's such a strong conflict of interest and smell about the thing that it's, it's very important that there are quite strict rules. And I think graduating it, you know, having a vote on a 1% transaction seems a bit heavy, but having a good strong rule that it needs independent advice is really helpful. So I think that is, is right. But it can be that there are related party transactions that do make sense. So I think it's right to allow them, but under strict scrutiny. Acting in concert is really about people coming through and trying to break through the mandatory bid. And I've seen really bad abuses of minorities by people acting in concert and trying to deny it. But because they're always circumstantial and people talking in the pub or across the border, it's very hard to prove it. But it's good to have that there as a, as a deterrent against that. And in terms of um, the long-term engagement, and again, it relates back to the acting in concert, it's right and good to have shareholders working together, particularly in a diverse base. But if you, um, I think if we try to regulate and put too much disclosure in, we'll find, particularly for smaller companies where the engagement isn't that great, we'll actually lower liquidity and actually make things more difficult to get people to engage. So I caution people about too much regulation around the engagement front. Thanks very much, Patrick. Any, anyone want to respond to those? points, particularly perhaps the last one about whether... I completely agree. So. <laughs> <laughs> whether there is a, a, a danger that by going for too much transparency you actually get in the way of engagement for some of the, of the, some of the smaller institutions or, or smaller owners. Uh, all, yeah. all agree with you. Thank you. Unanimity <laughs> at last. Anyone else wanting to raise a, a question or make a comment? You're still getting over last night's celebrations, aren't you? There's one. There's one. Chris. Ah, sorry. Over here. Thank you. I'm Cordula Held from Deutsches Aktien Institute. I have a question, um, a more a systematic question when it comes to related party transactions. Related party transactions might be uh, transactions that are normal, I don't know, M&A transactions. And uh, I don't know how it is in your systems, but in, in the German system, the AGM does not decide on such uh, transactions normally. So this is all due to the, the uh, management board in, in our system and the supervisory board takes a look at it. So if you start doing this like um, having uh, a say on pay, having this related party transactions in, um, in uh, the um, AGM and there was a, a non-paper by the EU Commission asking uh, um, uh, stakeholder groups uh, what they think of the, the following uh, idea, having um, also a say on in the next board members or other major transaction in the AGM. Have you got a new trend here that um, actually shareholders are taking over the management um, um, body actually? Interesting challenge. Yeah, no, I suppose as, as we were talking about the German experience, you're the obvious person well, to I ask think, to respond first. I think it all goes back to uh, a proposal of the European Corporate Governance Forum in Brussels. I think they initiated uh, this thought because uh, they had the feeling that this is a major topic because of the conflict of interest and that it is not taken in much, uh, enough care of. Uh, I know the situation in Germany, uh, but it does not mean that it's perfect. And I think we can always have a look uh, if the information is really sufficient and uh, if we cannot do much more in this regard to avoid any um, you know, suspicion uh, on these uh, transactions, uh, which are really a major conflict of interest. Yeah. Does anybody else want to respond to the, uh, the sort of question, challenge at the end that are we getting to a position where shareholders are beginning to take over decisions that rightly rest with management, either in this area, you, you mentioned say on pay as another example of that. Uh, any, any comments on that? Well, I, I would just, uh, just uh, uh, would like to point out the, 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 the method how we, how we uh, address the, the, the issue. I mean, because it seems to me that, uh, that the, the, uh, the uh, IS 24 standard uh, did a very good 
good job, at least uh, in, in the way that, that uh, defined the related party transaction and then, and then uh, that information is, 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 uh, is available in the, uh, uh, in the reports. Uh, so the, the, the question is more here, what should, 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 what should be the next step or, uh, and, and which level the, the EU should intervene in this in, in this process, because it, it looks like, I mean, there's a number of solutions in, in, in different countries, and they, 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 might, uh, they might be okay in, in these countries. So uh, is there any, any, any need to have unified solution for, 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 for that? That's, that's my point. Of course, everyone must probably agree that this is a really, uh, how to say, uh, important question, and, 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 and uh, uh, a lot of things might be, might be, uh, might be Bad things might be done in, in, if, if there's not if there's no proper regulation. But still, the question was on the methods. What what the legal strategy we need to to choose in order to to have the 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 and if we are choosing what the enforcement and rules uh, they 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 need to go uh, in line with that. Because if we are just saying please disclose something and there's no uh, enforcement possibility, so then it's, then uh, how it practically will work. Thanks. Are we, do we have time for one more question, if there are any? We have five minutes over, uh, during, we, we can hardly refuse to let the Commissioner make a comment, can we, sir? Uh, and then after this, I'm afraid we, we're overrunning slightly, although we started slightly lately, but uh, we'll, we'll let you go to your coffee. Uh, Thank you, Chris. Uh, Jeroen Hoyer. I have a question which, which sounds a bit provocative, but I really don't mean it like this. Um, it, it's a question more to Annika and to, to Mikkel. Miko, you, you said that uh, BlackRock manages around three or four trillion euros, I think. I think you said that. Now, I just ask myself, if you're so big, and we had the debate on banks, too big to fail, too big to save, how, how does this work out when you have a massive investor like BlackRock in a small market, uh, let's say in Sweden, in Denmark? What, what kind of issues can arise then? Have you experienced this, Annika? How do you look at this? Certainly, if you want to have this long-term engagement, what happens if a massive investor like BlackRock at a certain moment decides to sell? What does it mean for a stock, for a small stock market? Are there implications, or am I too, too cynical here, too negative? I, I, I'm not sure if I got the question. Your question was about activist shareholders active in, in the Swedish market and my experience of them more. I think it was specifically about whether you have a large global institution, what the implications of some yeah. of the decisions they will take in, in smaller markets, is that right? And whether that has a, a systemic issue, I suppose. Yeah, no, I think the difference is being between an activist shareholder and an active shareholder. There's a big difference in it. We are, we're not an activist shareholder, we're an active shareholder because we don't seek to micromanage these companies. We, te we seek to... Uh, try to understand their position. We present our views as a long-term shareholder, uh, and we try to listen to their to their responses. You have to understand that, as I mentioned in the beginning, 80% of all our investments in equities are passive investments. It means you can't you can't sell. Meaning you are there for the long term. So you are forced to engage. You are forced to enter into a dialogue with the company, because we know that corporate governance at some point, especially poor governance, has an effect on performance at some level. Therefore, you want to safeguard. It's more of a, you should understand our role as more of a risk identification purpose in that sense. You want to identify what risks are you exposed to as, a, as an investor in that specific company and what can you do through dialogue to make changes through those, um, through those practices in corporate governance where you happen not to agree or have a different view in that sense. But I think um, and we vote 15,000 meetings every single year. We, we meet around 1,200 companies a year. Yes, you cannot cover everything, but you shouldn't assume that there are problems all the time in all the companies in that sense. A lot of the voting-related activity is also a lot of standardized uh, AGMs that you just need to vote through, and you need to focus on those that are perhaps more problematic or where your size of the holding is larger in that sense. Did you want to very quickly say anything? Uh, uh, more, more a general comment. Uh, I see corporate, good corporate governance as a tool that creates interest in a company. And the discussion in Sweden has maybe been that the shareholders are not active enough, they are, not, uh, they are a bit lazy and, and not that active. So if we have active shareholders that cause discussion in, in the papers and media, that is something that I find 
we find positive because that creates interest in the companies and good corporate governance is a tool to create interest and visibility uh, in the company. I think that sums up the purpose of corporate governance very well actually. Um, I'm afraid we'll have to stop there. I'm slightly disappointed because I think we're just beginning to get into some of the most interesting issues but uh, there's many more interesting issues still to be discussed today. Uh, please join me in thanking Paul for the presentation and for the whole, the whole panel for a very interesting discussion. And then uh, I will hand back to Antanas for the next bit.